I would invite you now to stand as you are able. <clears throat> the Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 18th chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley, where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now, <clears throat> Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with, the, with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. So he asked them again, Whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you seek me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. Of those whom you gave me, I have lost not one. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant ear and cut it off. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that my Father has given me? This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Deliver me, O Lord my God, for you are the God of my salvation. In you, O Lord, do I put my trust. Leave me not, O Lord my God. Rescue me from my enemies. Protect me from those who rise against me. Deliver me, O Lord, my God. For you are the God of my salvation. Rescue me from my enemies. Protect me from those who rise against me. Congregation may be seated.
grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our meditation tonight comes from our gospel reading, specifically these verses, John 18, 4 to 9, return from betrayal. As I looked at this section of scripture and the whole idea of betrayal, this was my first thought. Me? Me, a betrayer? I mean, I've done a lot of things in my life. There's a lot of sins that I can chalk up on the board. I've never, for 30 pieces of silver, betrayed my Lord and Savior that I know of. You know, the more I thought about it, I heard this message from the Spirit. Pastor Mark, hold on a minute. You may need to take a closer look. Betrayal is not in my normal vocabulary. And I do spend time repenting of my sins, but I can honestly tell you, betrayal is not a word that would come up often. There are a lot of other words, but not that one. So I've been to think about what, what are we talking about when we talk about betrayal? Betrayal of a confidence. When you put your trust in somebody or say something in confidence to somebody, and they not only tell somebody else, but use it against you, that's betrayal. Especially that part about trusting in somebody else. So, first thing that came to mind from culture, and maybe you've seen this movie, is Mission Impossible. The first of the series that came out in 1996. For those of you that are not familiar with it, go watch it. No, just kidding. It's, uh, it's about this, this secret group of spies, and they do the kind of things where their missions don't exist on paper, and if they get caught, they disavow all knowledge of it. So one of the main characters is Tom Cruise, and he plays Ethan Hunt. And he and these other members form this unique special team. And they're sent out on an assignment. But this time, everything quickly falls awry. And almost all the other members of Ethan's team die horribly because they've been betrayed by somebody within the organization. In most of the movie, Ethan is out to try to figure out who did it and to get vengeance against them. Because him being one of the only survivors, they're all blaming him, that he's the betrayer. Otherwise, how could he have survived? But he's innocent. In the end, his boss, his mentor, his friend is the one who was the betrayer. And in the end, Ethan gets justice against him. Well, that's the movies. The more I thought about it, the whole concept of betraying somebody, betraying a trust, well, it takes me back to my time at Hiller's as a, as a union worker. And I would do things and that would get me in trouble. I did. And sometimes I had a choice. I could either take it all upon myself, which I'd like to tell you that I did, or I could do what was common in the lingo back then, throw somebody else under the bus. Somebody else that might have been involved with what I was doing, perhaps it was taking an extra long lunch and taking that someplace where I shouldn't, down at the bar in the mall and coming back. And well, there's two of us walking in together and the other guy gets stopped and I continue walking. We both had alcohol on our breath. I never said anything. Later on, the manager comes and talks to me, and I'm like, well, I don't know. Threw him under the bus. He actually would have kept his job, but he got fired and mouthed off, and they fired him. I've done that. Perhaps you have too. Perhaps there's been a time where, so you wouldn't get in trouble, you threw somebody else under the bus and let them take the full brunt when you should have at least had some of it. Then there's those times in high school, that young love, where you're going steady with somebody and you promise that they're the only one, except there's a great big asterisk on there, the only one until somebody better comes along. Are you thinking about somebody else? Are you seeing somebody else? Oh, no, not me. There's a trust there between you and the other person, and uh, I think each of us at a time or two have 
violated that trust. That's betrayal. Whether any of those things happen to you or not, I can guarantee you we're all guilty of this sin. All of us. Even the man that was called the man after God's own heart was guilty of betrayal. And who's that? That's King David. Now the story in our Old Testament lesson is very well known by us. It's known better as the adultery story of King David, right? But let's take a little bit different look at it and see how it's also a story of betrayal. King David was married when he met Bathsheba. Matter of fact, he had seven wives. Each one of those he had made a promise to. And each time he gathered a new wife, he betrayed that promise before the Lord. Although the Lord allowed and con- didn't and allowed some of these leaders at various times in Israel's history to have more than one wife, he never really condoned it. You go back to Genesis, it was always one man and one woman. And in each case where a leader had another wife, it caused problems. And David was not immune to that. He already had seven. So here he sees this beautiful young lady. He's home. He should have been with his army. He should have been out there leading his army, but he's home, number one. Number two, he's up wandering around on the roof, probably because he's looking for trouble, and he finds it. He sees her, and he calls her to him, and she comes. She leads him into betraying her promise to her husband, and he breaks the promise to his wife. And the result is, she becomes pregnant. Now there's a problem. That pregnancy is going to bring out the fact that, well, where was Uriah, her husband? He wasn't in town. He was off fighting. It's not him that's the father. And Dave is afraid that it's going to point to him. He's got to do something. He's going to throw somebody under the bus. And that person he throws under the bus is Uriah the Hittite. Not just any soldier. One of David's mighty men. This was a group of 35 or 40 men that were dedicated and promised to be faithful and true and to protect David. Kind of like his own personal militia. His own group. Strong men. Valiant men who were willing to lay down their life for him, even before he was a king, when he was running from Saul and hiding in the wilderness. These guys stood by him and protected him and were willing to die for him. Uriah is one of them. Well, David starts out by inviting Uriah home, gives him some wine and some drink. He figures this guy's been away for a long time. Here's his wife. He'll go and lie with his wife. And then we can blame Uriah for the baby and not me. Except Uriah is so honored and so committed to David and the army, he refuses to do that. My, my compadres, the rest of the people I'm fighting with, they're, they're not at home with their wives. They're sleeping out in a field. How can I do that? My heart is with them. My heart is with you, King David, and your army. I want to win for you. And he refuses to go home. Now David has a real problem, doesn't he? And the solution he comes up with is just despicable, especially considering who Uriah the Hittite is. By Uriah's own hand, gives him a message to take back to Joab the commander. Storm the city, put him out front, pull everyone back, and let him die. Uriah, the man who stood by David, who honored him and fought for him, was betrayed by David, all so David wouldn't get in trouble for what he did was wrong. Terrible. Terrible, terrible story, is it not? What's even more troubling is how David responds after it happens. His statement just lacks 
any kind of remorse over what he's done. When the messenger comes back and tells him that Uriah the Hittite is dead, David said, ah, tell this to Joab. Don't let it trouble you. It's war. In war, people die. It's all right. Strengthen your attack. Go back at it, and I'm sure you'll win the day. This is his response when one of his mighty men, who stood up for him time and again, was killed by his own hand. There's a lack of remorse and repentance there, isn't there? That's the man after God's own heart. How did God react? The thing that David had done displeased the Lord. I think this is an understatement. I think we can add greatly displeased the Lord. God knows what it's like to be betrayed. Jesus, who was God in human form, experienced those emotions himself in the Garden of Gethsemane. He knows the hurt of betrayal. One of his own, one of the twelve that he had picked to follow him, is the one who betrayed him. Men that had followed him, and they enjoyed each other's company on the road, and they talked, and he taught them, and he shared food with them, and I'm sure he shared some laughs with them. They saw him do mighty, mighty miracles. He prayed with them. He prayed for them. And in the evening that he would finally be sent to the cross and die, his last evening with those disciples, in the middle of that dinner, Judas walks out and leaves to go start the process that would send Jesus to the cross to go and betray him. We have Jesus in that upper room saying to Judas, go do what you need to do. And there has to be so much sorrow in that voice. Jesus was God, but he was a human being. And he knew the pain of hurt. He knew the pain of betrayal. He experienced them, and he experienced in the garden. He knew that Judas was on his way. Judas, for his part, this wasn't just a crime of passion. What he was going to do was carefully, carefully planned. He had gone to the chief priest beforehand and arranged to betray Jesus. Thirty pieces of silver, which, by the way, is what it would cost to buy a slave. Betrayed him for pretty much nothing. Then gathered together an amazing group of guys to go out just to arrest this one Galilean rabbi, unarmed, and 11 other Galileans who are not soldiers, who only two of them have any weapons, but they don't really know how to use them. They're not fighters. And who comes out after them? Well, Judas by the appointment of the Pharisees and the chief priests, Roman soldiers, a cohort, which would have been 500 to 600 soldiers, probably not the entire cohort because they're there to guide Jerusalem, but a good number of them. They probably came along because they wanted to make sure that there were no other Galileans gathered around with Jesus that would cause a revolt or an uprising. They'd seen enough of that in the past at previous Passovers. Roman soldiers, armed with swords, trained in battle, are heading out for Jesus and these 11 men. And not just them. Temple police. Men that don't have swords, but they're armed with clubs. And not just them. A crowd. A crowd of people all aligned against Jesus. Torches and lanterns, weapons, going out for this one rabbi and 11 followers. Got to wonder, what did Judas expect to happen? He knows who Jesus is. He knows what Jesus can do. He knows the power that Jesus has. Do you think he's a little scared? I think he's a lot scared. He wants backup. But none of that has deterred him from what he's decided to do. 
He is under control of the power of darkness, the darkness of sin in his heart, darkness that would move him to betray his rabbi, his savior, who loved him. And so it is that they march out, and, and Jesus knows they're coming. He knows everything that's going to happen. He's been suffering with this. We had his prayer in the garden. This is what he's praying about. He knows what's about to happen. He knows this arrest is coming, and after that, there will be terrible, horrible sufferings that he'll go through. Now, he could have hid from them. He knew they were coming. He could have went anywhere else to spend the night. Judas would have had no idea where they're at. They were already expected to have to search for him because they had lanterns and torches. But those lanterns and torches weren't needed. Jesus purposely took his disciples to the same place where they always spent the night. The same spot in the Garden of Gethsemane. Because Jesus is in hiding. And we see that when they finally get there and present themselves. They come. Jesus doesn't stand back. He walks out to meet them, to confront them. He comes forward and says to them, Whom do you seek? Now, in the other gospel accounts, we have the kiss, the betrayer's kiss. John doesn't mention that. But we're going to see in verse 5, it says, Judas, who betrayed, was standing with them. Many commentators feel that means Judas was out front. The first one that came, on initially Jesus coming out and meeting them, Judas does the kiss, a kiss that is supposed to be a sign of peace and love, is the sign of betrayal and that this is the one that is to be arrested. How awful is that? So the sign has been given. Yet what doesn't happen? Nobody moves. Who are these men? Well, as Judas shrinks back in the crowd, we've got Roman soldiers. We've got soldiers that are taught to stand and be fearless and to attack. And nobody moves. So Jesus addresses them, whom do you seek? Now, they've come out to arrest a traitor. They've come out to arrest a man who's a traitor to the Roman government and somebody who's a Jewish lawbreaker, a blasphemer, and deserving of death. The correct response to be, should be, you, you traitor, you, you criminal, we've come after you. But what we do have is a response that sounds more like in a court of law when you're standing and talking to somebody who's charged but not yet found guilty. Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus responds, I am he. Now there's more here than just Jesus identifying, I'm the guy. It's pretty obvious with what happens. I am. There's a translation of the Hebrew word Yahweh, the name of the triune God the name by which the triune God was to be worshipped, the great I am. Jesus is saying a ton in this response. I'm the guy you're looking for, but I'm also the Lord God in the flesh. Now, once again, these are Roman soldiers trained to react. Temple guards... They hear this, they should have sprung forward and grabbed him. This is definitely our guy, he just admitted it. But they go in the wrong direction. They fall backwards and fall to the ground. Now we're not told here, but this is, I believe, a proleptic sign of what will happen on the last day. All those who betrayed Jesus, whether they believed in him later or not, will face him and will fall on their knees, prostrate, and recognize him as who he really is, the great I am. Jesus' words have power. Not because there's some kind of a magic spell, but because he's the Lord God Almighty. 
the one who spoke creation into existence, the one who gave these people the breath of life. His words have great, great power. This is not a band of soldiers that are overpowering him. This is Jesus in control of everything that's happened and allowing it to happen for a purpose. So imagine them finally getting back up, standing back up, yet nobody's moving yet. So Jesus asks them again, Whom do you seek? Jesus of Nazareth. I told you. I am he. So if you seek me, let these go. Jesus is facing arrest and more pain and suffering than you and I can ever imagine or ever tolerate. And he's not worried about himself. Out of love, he's worried about these 11. These 11 who will soon betray him by taking off and leaving him. Even though they promised beforehand, no matter what happens, Lord, we will stand by your side, they will leave. They will all betray him. And yet he loves them so very much. Jesus' words have force. Let these men go, assuring that they will not be captured and they will not die. That fate is only for him. And it fulfills his promise. Jesus made a promise in the high priestly prayer, which was prayed just before he left to go to the garden, where he told his father, all of those you have given me, I have lost none of them. When Jesus makes a promise, he keeps it. He would never betray his heavenly father. Now at this point, if this is where it ended, everything would be fine. They would take Jesus and the disciples would be left. Except Peter, well, Peter's the kind of guy that can't stand to let God's will play out without having a hand in it. He pulls the sword, draws it, and strikes the high priest's servant on his right ear and cuts it off. Now it is important to notice he doesn't attack one of the Roman soldiers. He doesn't attack one of the temple guards. They're armed. He attacks a servant that's unarmed. Perhaps one that was actually sent to bind Jesus, we don't know. And Jesus responds quickly and definitively. Put your sword into its sheath, Peter. Stop that. Did I not tell you all those times on the road to Jerusalem, and even here in Jerusalem, that there's a cup of wrath that I must drink? And I told you, this is it. I have to take this. I have to be arrested. Jesus responds, I think, because, well, you've got these Roman soldiers and temple guards and they're keyed. Can you feel the tenseness of this situation? If Jesus doesn't do anything, all 11 could end up dead. Roman soldiers' swords come out, clubs come out. But it doesn't happen because Jesus is still in control because all of these things must happen. In Matthew, we get this additional thing. Jesus talks to all of them there with weapons. Those who take the sword will perish by the sword. Y'all put your weapons away or all of you will perish. And by the way, do you think that I cannot appeal to my father and he will at once send me more than 12 legions of angels? Angels, you wouldn't even need 12 legions. One angel is more than a match for all of them. But that's not the father's will for me. To be captured and suffered and die, that's his will. Because scripture must be fulfilled. And this from Luke 22. This is to that group that has come out against him. Don't you remember? I was with you in the temple day after day teaching you, and you never laid a hand on me? You're not overpowering me now. This is the hour of the power of darkness and the prince of darkness. But it's being allowed by my father 
It's being allowed by me. It's being allowed for a purpose. I will be taken by that power of darkness and I will suffer horribly, but only because I'm giving myself over to it. And I am still in control because all of this must happen. Let's look back in the story and figure out what happens to betrayers. Well, there are those that are repentant. Who are the repentant ones? David. God loved David so much that he sent the prophet Nathan to him and laid it all out with a nice little parable about a cute little lamb that this horrible guy kills. And then says, David, you're the man. Uriah the Hittite was that poor little lamb and you sacrificed him to have his wife and you are guilty. And David broke down and fell on his knees and said, yes, I am guilty. Oh Lord, please forgive me. And Nathan pronounced those wonderful words, it is completely forgiven. What about those 11 disciples? They took off. Jesus knew they would. But what happens on Resurrection Day? Our Lord and Savior comes to each one of them and they confess and break down and he forgives them. Yes, I died and you left me, but you know what? I have risen again. And on that cross, I forgave every single one of your sins, including your betrayal. You are completely forgiven. You are precious children of the Heavenly Father, and I love you. Peter's words to those that were gathered in the temple. You, you killed the author of life, but repent. Repent and receive forgiveness from the Lord because he loves you. It's a wonderful word for us too. Forgiveness and grace abounds for all with faith who have repentance. But what about the unrepentant? Well, what about Judas? Judas. After the fact, we know Judas realized his guilt, throwing the money back at the priests in the temple. Never asked forgiveness. It's conjectured that somewhere along the way, if he had faith, he gave it up. Without faith, he didn't have anyone to turn to. Didn't believe in anybody to repent to. And he ended up horribly committing suicide. What happens to the unrepentant in this world? They remain unrepentant till the end. They will suffer eternally a fate much worse than Judas' temporal fate. How is it that anyone can be forgiven? How is it that some are repentant and some aren't? Nothing to do with us. Nothing to do with me or you. It's all God's grace. It's all faith. Faith in what? Faith in the cross and in the tomb. That thing that Jesus must go do, that suffering that he must experience, was to wipe out all of our sins, all of the times we have betrayed him, to clear that record from our record forever. And then to rise again so that we know it is forgiven, so that we know our fate will not be worse than Judas. Our fate, our future, is the future of Jesus and the resurrection, of him on Easter morning, a new glorified body to live forever. That's what we'll receive, not what we deserve. We deserve death. We will receive, by God's grace, eternal life. Not just that, life with him now. Even as we go out and betray confidences of other people and sin, Spirit is with us and points out those things in our life so that we don't remain unrepentant, so that we get on our knees, driven by the Spirit, 
and ask for forgiveness and then know by that faith, yes, Christ covered that on the cross and we are forgiven. You and I can return to the Lord from betrayal because of all that Christ has done for us. When you realize the times in your life when you betrayed somebody or hurt somebody, know that that's the Spirit pointing it out to you. And then the very next thing, as you say, my God, that was wrong, please forgive me, know that he is saying back to you, already taken care of, it is finished. Look to the empty tomb. Look to your baptism. You're forgiven. Anytime, betrayal or whatever your sin might be, the Lord declares back in Joel and to us today, yet even now, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and with weeping and with mourning, not a show put on, but genuine sorrow created by the Spirit through the law. Rend your hearts. Return to the Lord your God. Why? For he is gracious and merciful slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relents over disaster. No matter what you've done, he loves you. He abounds in steadfast love for you. Seek the power of that love and live it out in your life. And if there's anybody that's ever hurt you in betrayal, well, you've been forgiven so much, try forgiving them. And in doing so, maybe be the means to introduce them to the Savior who died for all of their sins. Amen.